Welcome into K-State Online. I am Mason Voth. That is Derek Young, and we are here for another spring football update on the Cats. This one comes uh, with a little bit more substance attached to it because yesterday, amongst all the hecticness that went down as K-State picked up their first basketball portal commit of the year, Doug McDaniel, a, a big grab for them. Joe Klanderman uh, was just business as usual, talking to the media as well as some of the other defensive coaches uh, in veneer. And Joe Klanderman had a lot of really insightful things to say that not only give us a look at kind of where the defense is shaping up right now, but also even some of his insight on the offensive side that would get people excited. And I think it's good to hear from Joe Klanderman and a lot of what he said should have people excited because if you're like me, I, I know that there's – glaring questions on the offensive side but more than anything I think K-State's success in 2024 is going to be dictated by how good the defense can be and based on all indications that Joe Klanderman gave on Wednesday he himself thinks that they are going to be pretty good so before we dive into the specifics I mean what was the the overall tone and vibe like yesterday getting to hear from all the defensive guys yeah I mean I came away thinking the defense was going to be better than what I probably thought going into that, but I guess I'm not, I'm not trying to pump the brake, so to speak. We just talked about this off air a little mm -hmm. bit, but I do have to remember like Joe Klanderman makes me feel like this just about every time I talk to Joe Klanderman. I don't think he tries to mislead folks or, you know, construe something in a different way to be misinterpreted or to get people's hopes up just to, you know, smash them down. But by nature, he is a pretty optimistic coach, I think. And that's why his interviews and press conferences sometimes tend to be more, I don't know, productive is the right word, but like you said, a little bit more insightful and substantive because, and we, we just, you know, discussed this out of all the coaches he talked to the one where it pours out even more about their love for football is Joe Klanerman. I don't think, like we said, I don't think he's trying to, lead people on, but I think he gets, and you said he gets excited because you can just tell how much he loves football. Yeah. Talking football with Joe Klanerman is like talking WWE with Mitch Fortner. Uh, yeah, they're just, go. they're going to perk up and be excited. Whereas I think you talk to some of the other coaches. It's like, if you talk to me about like, Oh, how great is it to, you know, work at home so you can stay at home with your kid all the time. And I'm like, eh, you know, 75% of me is going to be really jazzed about that conversation. Be like, it's great. It's awesome. And then there's also a part of me that, you know, occasionally is going to be like, eh, I don't know. Like there are times where I wish that I could, uh, you know, not do that, but it's great most of the time. I think that's how the football coach situation is. And that's not like a bad thing. I think yeah. like those guys obviously love and put a ton of time into what they do, but Joe Klanerman, it's like eyes light up and that man is ready to roll. The other 25% uh, of you wishes you were in Cincinnati eating Skyline chili. Uh, I don't know. I If if the two options were stay at home with an almost eight-month-old baby and eat Skyline chili, then I'd go 100% in on staying with the uh, eight-month-old baby. Cause, and um, eat her food instead. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I could get by with some of it. Uh, I don't know the... She's really into pumpkin right now. I don't. That's kind of an odd mm -hmm. one. But I could get down with like the apples and the pears. Uh, I don't know. We'll we'll see as pumpkin. we expand a little bit. Yeah, I don't know. Her and the dog both really love the pumpkins. So tell the, tell them wait till October. They're like those people that drink pumpkin spice lattes in April. Yeah, no, she's down for it. She's she's a big fan. All right, well, let's get into uh, the Joe Klanderman hype train, and we'll start with uh, a good spot because one of the groups that. I, I don't know. People were probably going to have some questions about, but we know that there's a lot of depth, and that was probably the word of the day yesterday was depth was used in almost every position. But almost every single defensive end on the roster got name-dropped yesterday, and uh, that seems to be a good sign for K-State. Uh, first word that came to my head was deep, um, diverse. I mean, I think we've got uh, a good mixture of, of – Younger guys that are extraordinarily talented. I mean, we just hit absolute grand slam with the, the class of defensive ends a couple of years ago with uh, with Chidi Obiazer, Jordan Allen, and Ryan Davis. I mean, all three of those guys I think are going to be stars in this program. I, I don't, I'm not bashful about saying that. And then when you combine those guys with uh, the Cody Stuffelbeans, the uh, Brendan Motts, the guys that have some experience at that position, 
really excited about where that's at. And, and we're trying to find ways to um, maybe get more of those guys involved in what we're doing um, because that room is going to be one of our more talented rooms on defense for sure. All right, so there you go. Defensive ends get a lot of praise, and that's probably a good thing for K-State. They worked hard to bring some guys back that we weren't sure were going to stick around. And then you have, obviously, a, a good trio from uh, that were true freshmen last year that Joe Klanderman talked about, and then everybody in between. So uh, Joe Klanderman's perception of defensive end versus Derek Young's perception of defensive ends, how different are they? If you read one of my stories earlier this week, I don't know if it was the one I'm hearing or the buzz one, you know, they're all the same, just Intel otherwise, but is basically a perfect reflection, right? Because I said, I had a story. I was like, they love what they have at defense events. Now I didn't list every single one or I didn't list the same ones that he did. I did list, you know, Chidi Obiizer and Jordan Allen as two that they were excited for. I also listed Toby Osinsami and Travis Bates. Now he did go on to praise Travis Bates as well as someone that's really, you know, the transfer edition from Austin P that they really like. They brought back Brendan Mott and Cody Stuffelbean as well. They certainly have depth. This is one of the better rooms on the entire Kansas State roster at this point. And I think probably still working its way to a quality point because it's a lot of upside right now than anything. The depth is there. The quality is almost there, I think. So it's a group to really be excited about. So I just thought, you know, I kind of looked out in my story being really timely. Everyone, you know, if you read some of these inside stories, sometimes you're like, yeah, uh, maybe I got to see it to believe it. Uh, Maybe I want to hear it from more than one person, right? So we'll see. Two days later, all the coaches are like, yep, that's true. So I looked out there. I did also like that. I think we, you know, we just talked about Joe Klanderman, the person, and how he can be at a press co- conference. Was you know, li- listening and watching that clip back right there that you provided. It was funny that I think he kind of knows who he is too. He's because he, he issued all that praise. He's like, I'm not bashful about saying that. Yeah, you know, we we know Joe. We know. Um, and then he's also got the Pop Tarts full gear on. So oh. you know, bringing that back. I mean, that shirt is just so 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 good. Uh, yeah, look, I, and I think it was it's good to hear how he talked about these guys and you think about what K-State could be there next season. Since Chris Kleiman has been here, he's had a pretty strong stable of guys at defensive end that they've been able to utilize. I think at times you maybe start to to wonder, eh, you know, are are they accomplishing as much as they should? Um, I think, you know, like 2022, you were getting – the most out of your defensive ends when you needed it at the end of the season. I mean, they were, the sack numbers may not have been there, but they created a lot of havoc that forced bad throws of Max Duggan in the big 12 championship game. And I feel like that's one of those things that was missing at points last year. Now it, that might be unfair because we've talked about it numerous times in different outlets, but K state last year, they played basically in the regular season, they played eight games that were blowouts and then they played four games that were close. Um, like that's just a it's a it's a weird spot for them to be in. So it's tough to grade them because you're really only looking at four or five games. But Joe Klanderman even talked about yesterday, you know, there were some little things that we did that we were just like, I think he said like a foot or a foot and a half off of what we needed to kind of be that championship level of defense. And the way he's talking and going with this, it does seem like he sees that with K-State this year. And I think a lot of that is going to come down to what you get out of the defensive ends. I agree. I thought, like you said, for the most part under Chris Kleiman, it's been a really good position. I thought they were outstanding in 21. Um, You have that basically season-changing play from Felix Ndike Uzama against Texas Tech. And from there, the defensive line really takes off. Eli Huggins being in the interior really helps that group too. Um, They're still outstanding in 22 and they win a big 12 title. Obviously it takes sometimes you, it takes some time to replace, especially if you're Kansas state (laughs) and you don't just get to backfill with four stars and five stars up and down your roster, like in Alabama, Georgia, or Ohio state. So when you have a defensive line as good as that, sometimes, I mean, you don't necessarily aren't able to reload but you rebuild. And I thought from a defensive line perspective in 23, um, I wouldn't say they underwhelmed or underperformed. I just thought they were rebuilding 
last year across the defensive line. So it's going, I expect it to be much better. And it's, and he kind of mentioned it. You just mentioned it. You almost need like guys to trust their work a little bit. So you do have a difference maker. You do have a playmaker, a guy that, you know, makes the play that Felix did against Texas Tech. And, and there's probably, you know, a few others that I'm, you know, forgetting uh, that happened. But guys that just make that play that can alter a game or alter a season. And I think they feel like they're they're developing those now at them at this point, especially with that class, you know, that he referenced that they really love and and something that probably can extend to this and almost a, a little bit of a different topic of its own, but it's connected, is that he thought Joe Klanerman, the defense coordinator for Kansas State, thought that they relied or were going to rely very, very heavily last year because they didn't have the same amount of experience that they did in other years rely heavily on Daniel Green from a communication mm-hmm. standpoint and 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 you know getting the word out and and having that work itself through as well. So when he goes down at that point of the season, I think they were really in flux and probably scrambling the rest of the way. And, and we're talking about them scrambling and rebuilding last year, which I think it was is a good way to describe it. But at the same time, they were still top 3 or top 4 defense in the Big 12. You yeah. just we say we do this. We say we uh, mention this game on every show we do, and it's true. You take out the Iowa State game, and it doesn't feel as bad. Yeah, yep. Yeah, that's that is that is true. And you look around, like uh, I was looking this morning, they were eighth in the Big Twelve in sacks last year, but they were only like two away from being tied for third. Uh, Texas was really the only team that separated themselves last year. They had thirty-two sacks, and then you look around. K State had the second best completion percentage defensively last year and so that has a lot to do with obviously the secondary which I think got good marks from Joe Klanderman yesterday but also you are getting enough pressure to make guys uncomfortable at the quarterback spot so uh, we'll, we'll just have to kind of monitor that throughout the season because we'll do a little compliment sandwich here you know give the good stuff and then a couple of things in the middle that maybe uh, aren't so fun to hear and then finish it strong Linebacker was a position that my takeaway from listening to Joe Klanderman yesterday was he's not entirely sure about that spot yet. Feels good about maybe the depth. They have more of that right now. But who's going to step up there and how that looks uh, might be a bit of a question. You know, spring is about evaluation and it's about experimentation. And so we're uh, we're trying to find those guys and we are trying to push some guys uh, up with the, with, the, with the ones. You know, we're trying to get – Austin Romaine to realize that he's not a young guy anymore, that he's an old guy. And I think he's doing a great job with that. We are trying to stress Austin more by having him learn more than one position. Um, at the same time, there are guys like Cam Salas, um, Rex Van Wy, uh, guys like that that are, that are potentially going to find themselves in the mix um, to a much greater degree that, you know, we're, we're trying to see if, if those guys are, is it worth taking somebody else off the field to put them on? You know, and and so it's a huge evaluation time for those guys. So it's it hasn't slowed us down in what we're trying to do. I think all those guys understand what they're doing. Coach Standard does a nice job with that uh, in that room. It's just uh, can we get those guys to play at varsity speed? Um, And and that's that's where that's where uh, we've been making a ton of hay. I think this this week in particular. So this seems to kind of go along the lines of what we've discussed numerous times that. Everywhere on the defense, it seems like the personnel is somewhere. It's just about narrowing down, okay, who who is going to be the first guys on the field? Who is going to get the reps behind them? How is this all going to sort itself out? Lots of options for linebackers. They just need some guys to separate from the pack. Uh, wh- what do you make of the linebacker situation right now? Uncertainty, but some of that uncertainty is not necessarily – we don't have good enough players or that we don't know where anyone fits or we don't know if this guy can play or not. Some of it is a little bit of bad luck, to be quite honest. And and maybe it sounds like I'm giving them an out, an escape, escape hatch, so to speak. But think about it this way. Jay Clifton is hurt, not practicing, also maybe going on a mission. So they need him back, and that will help shore up the inside linebacker spot. But Jay Clifton not practicing because of injury, or recovery, I should say. Asa Newsom not practicing because of recovery. 
Bo Palmer not practicing because of recovery. Austin Moore probably resting a little bit, I would say, um, just because he's played so many snaps. They're probably approaching him like DJ Giddens, Desmond Purnell, another linebacker, and VJ Payne, guys that you don't necessarily need to play a bunch because they know what they're doing at this point. Mental reps, that's probably what he's talking about when he's trying to get Austin Moore to learn more positions. So some of it's just they're probably – you know, the guys that they're playing right now in practice and coaching right now in practice and putting on that first unit quite a bit is guys that probably are not going to be on that first team in the fall. So you got to think of it that way too. So they probably feel a little uneasy. Um, it's probably the same way that Mike Tuiasopo and, and Buddy Wyatt felt last spring when the defensive line had nobody, you know, um, they were pretty cracked out there. So, uh, I think the linebacker position is probably in a better spot than they feel, but I can understand the uneasiness because is Jay Clifton going to be there in the fall? How healthy or a hundred close to hundred percent will he and Asa Newsom be? Uh, and what do you do at inside linebacker? Because that's still kind of the question mark. You know, you're going to have Desmond Purnell, Sam and Austin Moore at the will. And, and backing those guys up are probably the two he kind of mentioned there, maybe a Cam Salas, maybe a Rex Van Y. So this spring is being very beneficial for them to get them. I like what he said. We're trying to find out if it's worth taking someone else off the field to put you on. I thought that was a lot of honesty and transparency there. And then the term varsity speed, I, I really appreciated that. Uh, all right, before we expand out and you know go beyond uh, the, the linebackers and we talk corners and safeties, let's go back in for a second because one of the spots that it seems like could be grouped in with the linebackers where there's some uncertainty, and this probably has more uncertainty for K-State because linebacker, you have the pool of guys to pick from. You just got to pick the right guys. D-tackle, you are probably a lot more thin there, and that's also a spot that like, experience and size and all the stuff that comes with being around for multiple years is something you need. It's tough to get, I think, really good depth at the defensive tackle spot. Uso Sayamalo is still battling coming back from injury, so that really only leaves you a couple of options. Uh, what are we thinking on defensive tackle right now for K-State? Yeah, right now they really only have, what, two scholarship players that are healthy enough to play in the spring and then two walk-ons and Titus Tui Asasopo and George Tralia. So you're getting probably a really good look at those two, obviously getting probably much needed reps for guys like Damian Eli Leo and Asher Tomaszewski. So, uh, and by the way, the Divas tackles, nothing against them, but they got some of the hardest names to pronounce. They do. Uh, Uso Sayamalo, Damian Eli Leo, Asher Tomaszewski. Um, yeah, that that's, uh, you know, Tui, uh, I think he's uh, – Doing but it on I, purpose. Well, I hope I hope Tim Brando doesn't have to uh, call a major moment from a defensive tackle this upcoming season. All right. Yeah. So I think the big takeaway I had there was uh, that you, you still bring back – and Javon Banks is playing inside and out. The problem with him is a weight thing, right? Um, he came in at 280, 290. He was like, all right, he can play inside for us, and now he's down to 260. So it becomes a little bit more challenging. He'll probably play – a little deep tackle. It sounds like, from what I've heard, maybe Cody Stuffelbeam, because he's as strong as an ox, will play a little deep tackle to maybe supplement things here and there in a pinch, probably try to put a little bit more weight on him. They're probably going to have to go out and get one, and hopefully they can find one that's quality enough. But at the end of the day, you still bring back your starter. The only issue being that they feel like, out of all the starters that come back, that have, that return this year at any position, it would have been so beneficial for Uso Sayamalo to get additional reps because although he's not a young guy, he's young in football learning and experience. He didn't play, you know, throughout his entire childhood. So I think they were, I don't know, I'm not, bitter is not the word, but a little disappointed that he's banked up too much to really be full go in the spring. All right, let's uh, let's move out now and get to the secondary. Joe Klanderman, I thought had a lot of good things to say about his safeties yesterday, and a lot of names in the mix there as well. Uh, and that's not necessarily because I don't think they have an idea of who their top guys are. I think they just feel comfortable 
that, hey, if we need to play more, we have the option to do so. Jack Fabris has been unbelievable. I think he's had a, a really good spring. Uh, Wesley Ferris had a really good spring. Both of those guys way above and beyond what we thought they were going to be relative to where they left off in the fall. Uh, we bolstered that position quite a bit, I think, with the addition of Jordan Riley. Um, he's come in and, and just seamlessly fit into what we do. Um, he's going to be a major part of who we will be next fall. Marquis Siegel has been as good as anybody in the country. I, re I really believe that. Um, you know, we're down VJ Payne and Colby McAllister. I think those guys will play big parts for us in the spring too. So when you when you tally up all those guys, and I, I know, uh, as you mentioned, Mikey Bergeron. I mean, there there are there are others. Um, Kendra Steiger's had a great spring. Daniel Cobbs has been in and out with some some nagging little injuries. Um, but we, we have as uh, much like the defensive end room, I think that's going to be a fairly deep room for us that we got to find ways to utilize those guys to the best skill sets. All right, there you go. That's uh, that's the book on the safeties and probably exciting for people to hear about Jack Fabris and Wesley Fair, two guys that were true freshmen last year. We saw Jack Fabris some, uh, but Wesley Fair, obviously a, a, a well-publicized guy just because he was in that crop of Kansas guys that came to K-State. And then Jordan Riley was the transfer ad in the offseason that you have been all over from the jump, D.Y. This has kind of turned into your, your John Kurtz, my guy. I hope the curse isn't attached to it. Uh, and then Marquis Siegel, who was kind of my guy last year, I at every game said he was going to get an interception, uh, and he just you know kept stone-handing everything, but got good, good notes from Joe Klanderman. So is safety the best position group K-State has right now? In terms of talent plus depth? Yeah, safety, D end, I would say. I know this sounds a little weird, but like wide receivers isn't too far off either, I don't think. Um, well, we'll get to we'll, that in a second because yeah, Joe we'll, Planterman we'll, yeah. stepped outside his depth and he gave a little insight on the receivers yesterday, too. Yeah, so I kind of like, if you gave me like, hey, DY, to the, from a talent upside depth, standpoint what three positions do you feel the best about probably wide receiver dn and safety would be the three that i would pick i don't know you can find two more mature experienced good football players at one position than jordan riley and marquis siegel i think that's got a chance to be a pretty dynamic pair and you add in vj Payne, and that's a really good starting group and I think some of us, you know, watch Colby McAllister, especially at the end of the season, was like, this guy's good enough to start on a lot of teams. So I think you got four that you love. And then you got Jack Fabers, who's coming along, who was good enough to play last year as a true freshman. Uh, yeah, he got shut down kind of early. My guess is that he wanted to redshirt, and that's probably why, and that he was actually good enough to keep playing. So that's another guy I think that they're going to be able to count on. You have five safeties to be able to count on. You feel good. They might have more than that. Like I said, like he said to Kendra Steiger, if he's having a really good spring with as old as he is, he's probably going to play. So um, can't say enough good things about the safeties. I expected that going in. He kind of confirmed my expectation and my feelings about that group. Uh, what he did was also probably make me feel a little bit better about corner. Um, and I started to feel a little bit better about corner just on the, you know, the little practice that we have seen because – Justice James, I thought, was a guy that played pretty well at the end of last year that could be someone in that the, the, the twos at corner to give you um, some relief there when you do have to take Jacob Parrish off the field or when you do have to take Keenan Garber off the field. Klanerman raved about Keenan Garber. Sounds like he's really had one of his best off seasons, becoming more and more comfortable at the cornerback position, playing faster. So you got, you, you got your pair of starters you like. Justice James continuing to ascend, and I thought that he started to earn those snaps with the twos last year and and was not, you know, when he was on the field, it didn't look like he didn't belong. It looked like he belonged. So, you know, you need to maybe get that one or two extra corners. Tyler Nalone's been banged up again. He's been banged up ever since he got to Kansas State. Will it be him? Uh, he's got to stay healthy. Darrell Jones, he's been banged up ever since he came to Kansas State. Will it be him? He's got to stay healthy. But – the one I liked, you know, in the, the minimal practice that we have seen has been Richard Freshman, Donovan McIntosh. Ton of size, ton of length. Sounds like he's continuing to get better. Someone that they're going to consider putting on the field this year. And he had a lot of good things to say about Kanigel Thomas as well. So you talk about 
I think that is the same class. No, not the same class as the defensive ends. I think they're a year behind. But it's like those that Dion class where he liked all three of Brian Davis, Chidi Obiizer, and Jordan Allen. Well, Kanigel Thomas and Donovan McIntosh were in that same corner class, and I think both of them are going to turn out to be really quality football players at Kansas State. Yeah, and you know, Keenan Garber also got uh, some good notes yesterday too, and I think uh, Joe Clannering just kind of talked about I think his comfort and uh, how he feels about himself moving forward is, I mean, you're going to get probably the best version of Keenan Garber that you've had at that position, and he started to turn it around last year in a really, really strong way. So that's the stuff on the defense, but Joe Klanderman, speaking of Mitch Fortner and Joe Klanderman being excited about things, uh, Mitch loves the WWE and probably, uh, I don't know, undersized defensive lineman since he was one for uh, Clay Center. But he asked about <laughs> which guys had been a problem for Joe Klanderman's defense during spring practice. This is what Joe Klanderman said. I don't want to use the word problem, but, um, you know, one guy that, that's impressed me a lot is Jace Brown. You know, I think Jace has made uh, leaps and bounds progress from where he was at the end of last year. And I think everybody kind of knew what Avery was going to be. Um, I think those young tight ends are developing uh, quite a bit. I, I, but I see a lot of improvement. Uh, the two guys that I, I probably see the most improvement out of, um, and, and this is just me, it, you know, the, the offensive guys might disagree, but I, I, Jace Brown and Keegan Johnson, I think are guys that are, are standing out to me uh, on a daily basis. I think that those are two really exciting things to hear for different reasons. Number one, I think everybody understands how good Jace Brown was down the stretch last season. He was basically K-State's top receiver, uh, probably from the Texas game on around that that area. He really took off, and they, they went to him more. So if he's made a leap from that spot, that's really good. And then Keegan Johnson obviously came in last year. The transfer from Iowa had the hype. Very slow getting going, had trouble getting onto the field for you know great lengths at, at time. But then he started to pick some things up, made some plays down the stretch. And if he's made a stride and gotten better, this could mean really good things for the K-State receiver room that has also added Dante Cephas, a Penn State transfer. And kept Jaden Jackson. So yes. you have four. And then you're hoping to get the continued development of two guys you think can be studs and Trace Spivey and Andre Davis. So that's why there's a lot of reason to kind of be like, is this going to be the year that you get a special wide receiver core? It could be. If Jace Brown is leaps and bounds ahead of where he was at the end of last season, oh, that, that's – you're getting into rarefied air at that point, I think, um, in terms of production and quality and talent and what it looks like on the field. And if Keegan Johnson is taking a step, then – and probably becoming more comfortable, needs to stay healthy. But if those things come together, then I think he becomes that alpha receiver that you thought he would be last year. Sometimes it doesn't click in year one. Um, it didn't for him. And, you know, I said I wouldn't call it underwhelming or underperforming, you know, the defense last year because it was a rebuilding year. But Keegan Johnson probably did, and he would admit that, that he underperformed, that he underachieved. But I think it's because sometimes for transfers, you go from one place to another place, it's a new place. It doesn't click right away. I've kind of said it a few times, both on our shows, um, when I do three mile with John and Cole. I think there's a chance that Keegan Johnson really blows up this year and kind of puts on the field what people thought he would last year. I, If I had to guess, that's going to happen. I don't know if that's a bold prediction, but it's my bold prediction. Uh, you know, I think I'll give it to you because uh, we know at times it can be uh, a little – Little tricky and dicey uh, for K State receivers. They, you know, got some guys got to live up to the hype there. But I think it's in a good spot. And then obviously you pair it with the fact that Avery Johnson is your quarterback next season. You are starting to get the ingredients to kind of add up. And and I mean, I think people were already pretty high on this team this coming year. And obviously the odds makers have been. We've talked about that at different points as well. But I, I think with everything we're hearing and seeing, and obviously. You know that these guys are going to lean more towards, I think, probably being um, excited and and say good things about their their players. That's kind of what you do. But you put all this together, what we're getting out of the spring, I think the expectation from K State fans is probably elevating past what they had even told themselves going in to twenty twenty four because it does seem like 
K State is the rightful favorite at this point to to be playing in Arlington. So it's exciting to think about uh, everything going on because I the defense had some question spots that I think I I got answered yesterday from Joe Klanderman, and then hearing more and more about the offense, I it really seems like we're just getting down to it'll be interesting to see how that offensive line wor- looks early on. So uh, good news for K State football, and this has been a probably a pretty productive spring for them and not a ton of negative to come out of it, which is always good because uh, I know you, you won't be shocked to hear this, but uh, Texas Tech has shut Baron Morton, their quarterback, down for the rest of spring with a, a, like a shoulder injury the other day. So K-State has avoided that uh, in great spots. Yeah, I think you're hearing good things, positive things, and really uh, strong praise for the guys that you thought they probably needed to hear that from in order to be as good as people think you're going to be in the fall. And then from on the flip side, you still need to probably shore up the linebacker position, which I think we all kind of had an understanding that that was probably going to have to be the case. And offensively, you got to bring those offensive linemen along. Yeah. We'll see how it goes. Uh, We'll get, uh, a few more looks at the team, and then spring ball so, start to wind down, and Chris Kleiman will give kind of his closing thoughts on everything that went down, and uh, we'll probably get a, a broader picture painted on both sides and where things seem to be going for the Wildcats. But for the time being, all seeming pretty good uh, with how spring is going for the Cats, and we'll keep you covered with more K-State football coverage at K-State Online. So head over to On3, find the KSO tab, and uh, if you're not a member – get joined up because you'll get insight on what's going on football wise, both with on the field stuff and recruiting, which is popping off. The cats have had a lot of pretty strong recruits in the building lately. They're going to have more continue to come to town. And then also basketball, the transfer portal going to stay hot uh, as Doug McDaniel is on board. Who else is next for the wildcats as they try to get back to the NCAA tournament and ready to make a deep run and compete in the big 12. So all that going on at K state online, We'll be back here on the KSO YouTube and podcast platforms tomorrow. It's Friday. We'll have a little bit of fun. D.Y. and Drew are going to go head-to-head in whatever game I have cooked up for them, and uh, we'll see if it sucks or if it's a lot of fun for them and, more importantly, the people watching. So, for Derek Young, I'm Mason Both. Thanks for watching and listening to K-State Online. Back again tomorrow.